Great. Well, welcome everybody. It's lovely to see so many, so many of you joining us. So we've got 35 people in here. So um, yeah, very, very big and warm welcome from the Community Eye Health Journal based at the International Centre for Eye Health, which itself is hosted by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So this is our very, very special webinar on surgical mentorship and training. So I've got some fantastic speakers lined up for you. Um, I wonder, shall we do a quick introduction around the room and just say who everybody is. So I'm Almin Wolfart. I'm the editor of the Community Eye Health Journal. Um, and Hugh? Uh, I'm Hugh Bassett. I'm the communications officer at ICH and I help with uh, marketing and distribution at the journal. Fantastic, fantastic. And then um, we've got um, Ismail, do you want to introduce yourself? You're going to be our first speakers, Ismail and Verenda. So please introduce yourselves. Yeah, my name is Ismail Dinda. I'm from South Africa. Um, I've been uh, one of the the, the candidates mentored by Professor uh, Dr. Verena Sengwan, and it's a pleasure being here so I can say, share my experience. Um, uh, Dr. Thank Sengwan, you. I'm going to give it to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good evening, good morning. My name is Verena Sangwan. I'm a cornea specialist working at Dr. Sarov Charity Eye Hospital, India. I have worked on Orbis previously. That was 25, 30 years back. And <clears throat> I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, symposium. Fantastic. Thank you. Next up, Chiku. Hi. Hi, my name is Chiku Matenge, and I am an ophthalmologist based in uh, Rwanda. I am a clinician, but I also run a residency training program. And uh, thank you for having me today. Fantastic. Thank you. Finally, John Bucken. Uh, hi, I'm John Bucken, and I'm a consultant ophthalmologist in the NHS in the United Kingdom, where I've been training very junior doctors for the last 10 years now in cataract surgery primarily. Fantastic, thank you so much and welcome and a big thank you to all of our panelists and speakers today. So on to our first session, which is going to be about um, online virtual mentorship with the Orba Cyberside program. So over to you, Ismail and Verenda, thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna start off by just uh, giving you a short presentation on uh, what was experienced uh, by myself um, in uh, with, uh, the uh, Orbis uh, Cybersite. Um, I was introduced, the concept of on-site teaching has changed across the world. And uh, this became very evident when Ed COVID became, uh, when COVID erupted, I would call that, uh, erupted in, the, uh, in around 2020. And the thought came to my mind, why not enhance uh, teaching in ophthalmology using the available technology that we have. And I'd worked with Orbis and other NGOs in establishing an ophthalmic center at um, one of the outlying hospitals in South Africa. And the hospital catered for, out, for patients around uh, 600 patients per month. And they had the patients themselves were very of a, a very low income bracket. And the, the theater was equipped for interior segment surgery. And this is just a picture of the, of the highway or the freeway um, just demonstrating the population. It's more inform informal settlements around the area. And this is the clinic that we worked at. And this is what all us together with other sponsors have organized for the clinic or had organized for the clinic. So we set up the remote mentorship to improve my personal skills and optimize the uh, treatment options for the patients. And the aim was to bring the treatment to the patients. Um, the cornea remote mentorship um, it was organized by Orbis with uh, Dr. Verena Sengwan, who so generously offered his time and expertise in establishing this program. Um, Dr. Verena is a, is a world-renowned surgeon, cornea specialist, uh, who, is, who is multifaceted, and not only his ophthalmology aspects as well as in life, and I think he's a true mentor for myself and others. So we started the mentorship around 2020, and uh, predominantly focus on corneal graft surgery with uh, technical and uh, technical support for, uh, and mentorship organized by Orbis. The corneas are organized by a local uh, NGO and using the cyberside pro uh, platform uh, with, uh, we, with, which facilitated live surgeries, um, we were able to set it up. So all we needed was internet, which initially was difficult as we in an outlying area, a microscope with video cap capabilities, which Currently, I think is something that we can we can uh, we can bypass a laptop, microscope, speaker, connections, a cybersecurity account, and obviously Orbis assistance, and most importantly, a willingness to try. 
So this is a, a page that opens up once you register for CyberSite. Um, it's a login page and you essentially start a new case and that allows one to it's, it's, you choose whether it's a case related or case that can be viewed by public uh, and what type of case it is. So we've been through quite a few cases, the initial stages, uh, stages. as you can see the different surgeons um, and uh, just and this is the information that your mentor will receive. And Dr. Verena would, would normally get this information a couple of weeks before the planned surgery. And the, the treatment, the diagnosis and treatment, as well as any images uh, were loaded onto the system and suggestions were given. And that's just the interact, interaction between myself and um, Dr. Verena. This is a picture of what we heard. And now that I've... Uh, Technology is enhanced. I think it's important to take into consideration using something as an adapter using your smartphone, uh, which can bypass most of it. So this is a setup that we had at the clinic. And you can see that uh, we, were, we, were, we were lucky that we had a Zeiss high-end microscope, which allowed us to, give, uh, to get high definition optimal images. And uh, I'm gonna share another video of, of the surgery itself. And you can just basically hear exactly what goes on. So this is a portion. The aim, the aim of the surgery was we had a young patient who had bilateral corneal scarring. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's that's good. You are. Uh... This is the interaction between myself and Dr. Verna. This is live surgery on a live patient. And I'm going to just keep quiet for, but just to allow you to kind of. So you have to uh, keep uh, that tissue, uh, you know, even if you have to convert to PK, it's the same tissue can be used. To prepare the tissue in the last. It's just the debulking that is occurring, and, and this is going the type of interaction that would occur. And I move forward in the video. Yeah. Mm, like this, keep going. Mm, keep going, yeah. And now, now, now do the sideways. Uh, that is the decimus area, so to avoid that area and do sideways. Now you can do right or left side, and also you can go beyond the phone. Punctured? Uh, hmm. Oh. Okay. Uh, just, just what you do, it's okay. Uh, just try to remove this area uh, with the scissors and see how, how big is the puncture. Uh, no, no, don't do use this. There's no point now. So whatever you have removed uh, with the scissors, try to cut the scissors. Uh, like with the, these are fine. You cut here, yeah. Make, make a cut in the center. Yes. These are the so um, now invaluable tips that Dr. Sangwan passed on to me while I was doing the surgery, and I move on to the to the towards the to the end of the surgery. And this is where the graft is put on. Unfortunately, the dark wasn't successful and we had to convert to a penetrating keratoplasty. 
I'm going to stop the video at this point and uh, we can have a few points from Dr. Sengwan himself. Um, and uh... um, Yes, thank you, Ismail. Um, uh, you know, when we started working initially, I was not very sure how it's going to work. And uh, so anyway, I just agreed, okay, let us see. But as we progressed, I really enjoy it. And I was very happy that I'm able to help sitting uh, so far off uh, from you. And the view I got from your uh, microscope view uh, distantly, it was fantastic. And the audio was very, very good. So now I tell my fellows, especially those who come for short-term fellowship, I uh, encourage them to register on a cyber site and you know, do help with the remote mentoring. Because the physical or in-person mentoring um, is, uh, is a rate limiting in, in the society because there are not too many slots. There are not too many doctors. And this allows us to schedule and you know have a little more interaction. Uh, if we do it again, we continue. I would modify it in, a, in a certain ways that maybe we will have more interaction, uh, video uh, interaction or have uh, share surgical videos and discuss the philosophy behind the surgery. Um, I, so for me, it was really fantastic experience. The one point just to emphasize is that I'm sitting in South Africa and Dr. Sangwan is in a different time zone, different point in the day. And he's able to sit like an angel on my shoulder and carry out, give me instructions as to move forward. And I think that's a blessing that uh, we have available, available to us. And it's in the start of a new era in, in ophthalmic or ophthalmology teaching. Um, um, I, I think we 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 had a, we had a breaking point to kind of optimize or prioritize uh, the the best possible ophthalmic care in all parts of the world. I mean, are there any other questions that uh, that have come through or? Ismail, can I ask you a question? Mm, because yes, we, can, we we did not discuss these things. We were like both you were doing surgery, I was doing assisting and then went back to my outpatient. So when when you are doing surgery and when I'm talking, does it uh, does it make it more difficult for you to follow? Or uh, was it okay, uh, you know, asking or take uh, listening to the qu answers from me? That's a good point that you've raised, a good question. I think there's different aspects of understanding and interaction that takes place during the mentorship. So the mentorship, I think, would be broken down in the initial interaction between the, the, uh, the, the person being mentored and the mentor themselves. Um, if the, if, there's an, if the, the interaction prior to the surgery allowed that, that understanding of where your thought process was, so it, it wasn't difficult to kind of see where you wanted me to go during the process. So I think creating that relationship via CyberSite using the tools available helped me in that process. And what did you feel on your side? Were you nervous? Did you feel like you wanted to jump through the camera? Uh, no, no. I mean, um, you know, uh, those your surgical days were wetness days. And those yes. days happens to be my outpatient and my outpatient is very busy. So I would log on uh, to your surgery uh, in between my patient and I on the iPhone. Uh, so if, say, for example, if the time zone allows, if I can use my um, laptop and I'm very quiet, I'm not doing anything else, I think this can be, the process can be much more effective. Yes. So and that... currently, currently the cyber site is, to me, underutilized by the ophthalmic uh, community because they just simply not aware the technology is available, what it, what it is available, how it can help supplement the training. And this case, uh, uh, sort of uh, our case uh, suggests or, you know, illustrates the point that it, distance is not, doesn't matter. That's correct. We spoke about ourselves as a surgeon and a mentor, but the other aspect that was raised during that process was that the staff, the theater staff that were available were new theater staff. They hadn't been theater, uh, surgically trained. They were not surgical sisters. But because of the cyber side interaction and utilizing the, the, the resources available, they reached a level that they would be competent enough to assist in the corneal surgery. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Other thing, that, other thing that I realized, Ismail, was that. Uh, 
you know, if you say, for example, I'm uh, here in India, I use certain set of instruments and I take it for granted that you would have that. But I realize that you have um, uh, certain limitations that you may not have the same set of instrument that I use. So it, it makes, uh, you know, the trainer should be more aware that what the resources, what kind of instrumentation you have so that I'm aware that, okay, if this step goes in a uh, not in a way we want it so what is the what instrument you will use that that's also the point of getting the optimal equipment like the yeah. same one is so much more that i would love to discuss in this aspect um and share that experience but i think i'm going to pass it back to almin because uh, of yes. our time constraints um and um we we'll probably get to some point of questions as well lovely Thanks. Fantastic. It's really been wonderful to hear the two of you having a chance to sort of stop and re reflect about the process. I do have a, a really good question here from Daksha, uh, Daksha Patel. Hi, Daksha. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Daksha says, clearly the sense of communication and understanding between the mentor and mentee, mentee was essential. How did you build up this rapport before the surgery? Um, do you want to take it? I think, Dr. Singwan, why don't you start off and then I'll uh, kind of go from there. So, uh, Dixa, what we did was the um, uh, the CyberSide platform allows uh, us, uh, he, uh, Ismail will share his case report, he'll upload images, I will interact, answer those questions through that communication, and then we I would ask him, maybe we should have a chat before the surgery, and uh, we will go through the uh, steps, or we'll discuss, okay, this is what how we are going to do. So, it's a building up to the surgical day. Uh, yes, that's definitely an aspect. So obviously there's a concern on the mentee's side that am I going to be competent enough to carry out surgery on somebody's eye? Um, and that interaction or that approval usually comes through discussion with your mentor um, and they'll give you an idea as to where you're going to be. And um, I think this aspect of using mentee and mentor has uh, has been moved forward or has been enhanced by the, um, I'm not uh, by something called the FACO development uh, courses, and it's been used for cataract surgery. Uh, so cataract surgeries can be used, uh, can, can, can be, uh, people can be trained for cataract surgeries as well. Um, and um, so this, yes, exactly what Dr. Sengwon said. Thank you so much. You've just you've just answered one of the questions in the chat. So thank you. That's really good to know. I have an anonymous question here as well. And it, I must say it's something I was wondering about when you showed all the equipment that you're using. So the CyberSight platform is free, as we know, and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Maria Montero in just a little minute about that. But all the other stuff, all the equipment you needed to to kind of set this up so that you could do the mentorship. Was it very expensive? How did it work? Anyway, over to you. So that, that's the point I tried to raise within the presentation. So um, I don't think now at this point in time we need all that equipment. Using a right. smartphone and using an adapter, you can get optimal videos. Um, mm -hmm. Then adapter, and oh, oh, I'm going to see if I can go back to that presentation just to kind of share that part. Um, it's and and for the uh, for me, I use simple uh, iPhone. So for me, there was not extra uh, instrumentation or device required. Really so it's these type of adapters. There's a multitude of them available. Um, and essentially what is done, you use your smartphone and um, you can have live surgery using your smartphone. Obviously, you need some sort of um, uh, battery backup for your phone. Uh, if um, And the smartphone is connected to via the adapter using a, a side viewing piece just a viewing piece, not an assistant piece. So there's not much of a spend. There are other viewing models available, which can be quite pricey, but this usually costs around in a rand terms, about 450 rand, but you're looking at anywhere between 10 and $20. Um, so if it does break, you can get a new one. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Just don't drop the phone. That's the main thing. But it's 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 utilized. I think this aspect is underutilized. So the, the equipment did we, that we used um, did cost quite a bit. And um, that was the initial stages prior to us getting this 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 technology. Um, so I think nowadays you don't need much. And we've this particular model has been used for what I've mentioned before, the FACO development course where the live surgeries were being uh, watched or cases being recorded. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Ismail. That's great. Really, really helpful to know. And it, it seems much more within reach now for more people. So this is a really great time. Um, so both of you, thank you very much for an amazing presentation. Um, if anybody has more questions, uh, please pop them in the chat. Um, but we're going to move over to a presentation by Dr. Maria Montero from Orbis, uh, Orbis Cyberside, about Orbis Cyberside, how it works and how you can access it. So um, Hugh, if you could start that video for us, that would be great. Thank you so much. There's one more question at the moment. Yeah, about um, there's a question from Ravindra Sar um, about managing complications during the process. So I don't know if that's something that anyone has. Yeah, I, I think we should answer. We, sh we can answer. And if if uh, if uh, those of you saw that video Ismail presented, that was the complication. Our intention was to do a dark, and uh, uh, during the separation of the lamellae, uh, there was an inadvertent perforation. And if you uh, heard me saying that, okay, be a little gentle, go this direction, see, cut with the seizure. So that is how we manage the complication. And mostly all of the complications can be managed. And this, this was established based on my interaction with Ismail that, okay, he can follow my instruction and he understand with the, where the tissue, uh, what we are talking about. So I think uh, this video showed us uh, that your complication management is not very difficult. Yes. Um, so just, uh, I'm just reiterating that point. And is it visualized here? Uh, punctured? That's the puncture there. Oh. Okay. Uh, just, just what you do, it's okay. Uh, just try to remove this area uh, with the scissors and see how how big is the puncture. Uh, no, no, don't do use this. There's no point now. So whatever you have removed uh, with the scissors, try to cut the scissors. Uh, like we did, these are fine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. If this time at the end, I see we've just had another question pop into the chat, but we'll make time for that at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Um, it's time to move on to Maria's presentation. Thank you, Hugh. Yeah. Do you have any questions on this PowerPoint presentation or on everybody? Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Maria Montero, and I'm the Associate Director of Clinical Services for the Flying Eye Hospital. Thank you so much for the Community Eye Health Journal to do this webinar on surgical mentorship. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how we are at CyberSide with Orbis improving remote access to surgical training and mentoring. As we know, 1.1 billion people in the world are blind or visually impaired, and a staggering 90% of this blindness is completely avoidable. So we at Orbis, we aim to transform lives through the prevention and treatment of blindness. During the pandemic, we face the challenge to come up with creative solutions to distance and the pandemic, of course. So we try to bring people together remotely. And so we develop different ways to do so. At CyberSite, which by the way, it's our platform, it's completely free. If you don't have a registration yet, you go on cybersite.org. And here in this platform, you will find four different ways that you can improve your learning in ophthalmology. Please also remember that this page is not only for ophthalmologists, we have material for the entire ophthalmic team. The nurses, the anesthesiologists, the biomedical engineers can find training material here too. And the first way that we are trying to help out is with CyberSight Consult, where you upload a case and you get instant feedback. We're on CyberSight Learn, where you can find a library of different videos. And CyberSight Artificial Intelligence, where you get feedback from images and the CyberSight Live Teaching. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about each one. On CyberSight Artificial Intelligence, you can upload an image of any case that you may have and get in five minutes feedback from artificial intelligence and classifying your diabetic retinopathy or your glaucoma case. You will go on CyberSight and you can either select patient case when you can upload the entire information of your case or AI only case where you can upload just the image here and you will get a report within five minutes on it. 
On our library, you can have lectures, you can see videos, and these videos are classified by the different subspecialties. We have all the subspecialties covered. We have videos in 3D, and we have also translated several of them into a different languages too. We also use CyberSide as our platform for pre-learning when we do finite hospital programs in person. So we send out the pre-learning materials so the trainees get this material before we actually get there. This way they can review all the material and then when we go there in person, they get to ask the questions instead of hearing just the theory. This way it saves us time to focus on the actual hands-on training. The subject that I was going to talk to you about is our remote trainings. When you get this PPT, you can click on this link and check out the article that we published. On this article, we talk about three different ways of remote training that we have been doing at Orbis with CyberSight. The first one that we came up with in 2020 was the virtual wet lab training. On this training, we send out artificial eyes to Indian residents where they got to record themselves before any training happened and doing a small incision cataract surgery. Then they receive training weekly via live lectures with a volunteer faculty. And after each lecture, the residents recorded two extra assignment videos from the paracentesis, how to do the incision, how to do each step of the surgery. They record them themselves doing the step of the surgery that they had the lecture on that week. And then after the entire uh, sessions happened, they re-recorded themselves doing an entire small incision cataract surgery again. And then we mask those videos, we randomize them and we score them using the ophthalmic simulated surgical competency assessment rubric. Um, out of this study, nine residents completed a training, and of these trainers, we found out the, the average competency score actually increased significantly, showing that this training worked. Then we did another virtual simulator training in November and December of last year, where we again sent out artificial eyes and we had volunteer faculty, four volunteers faculty from around the globe, sitting either at their homes or at um, our operating room and transmitting live from that video recording to Chile. And in Chile, these residents were at a wet lab and they were uh, being helped by local faculty too. So they had live training with the local faculty and they also had live training from the volunteers that were elsewhere in the world. This was simultaneously training. So the volunteer faculty was doing the step of the surgery, which was something related to advanced VACO. So either iris suturing or hooks or anterior retractomy. And then they teached life on this simulation plastic eyes, and then the trainees replicated the steps that they were being taught live under microscopes. So it was like being there. And the third way that we are doing remote trainings is with virtual reality. We at Orbis are working on a virtual reality simulator with fundamental VR. So far, 37 trainees from Bangladesh, Mongolia, India, and Ethiopia have been training. And they receive two ways of training. One with a live mentor who is watching via Zoom what they're doing on the device, on the FBR, and giving them live advice on each step that they're practicing for small incision. And also the simulator, the machine itself, is giving them feedback. So the aim of this is, of course, that the simulator can give uh, quality feedback to the trainees and that they improve their confidence, they, they improve their train of thought, and of course their hand-eye coordination with the, this, this device. So please, if you have any questions um, on CyberSight or if you have any difficulties uploading a case or getting certain information, you can contact us at support at cybersight.org. Please, if you don't have an account, get one. It's completely free. And of course, if you would like to learn more about remote training, contact us too. 
you can find here in this last slide all my information. So if you have any questions on this PowerPoint presentation or our trainings or opportunities or anything that I can help with, I'm always happy. Thank you so much. Doc, Dr. Sangwan here, can I ask you a question? Uh, hi, Maria is not unfortunately with us in, in person, Dr. Sangwan. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, she wasn't able to make it, but um, I've put her email address um, and uh, the other email address that she shared in the presentation, I've put that in the chat. So um, anybody who wants to find out more, please write to Gabriella QBS at orbis.org and it's maria.montero at orbis.org. Um, for those those of you who are watching us on YouTube and who can't see our, our lovely chat. So, yes, thank you so, so much for that that section on, on remote mentoring. Um, so up next, we've got Chika Mathenge talking about her experiences from resident to residency uh, training coordinator, supervisor. Chika, please do a better job than I have in introducing yourself. Um, and uh, please take the stage. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing Chiku on the stage. I'm just wondering, John, would you be happy to, um, while we get Chiku back online, if you could um, present your talk, that would be amazing. Thank you. That would be no problem. Okay, I'll share slides. So um, my role is very much in training of um, new ophthalmologists in their first or second year of training. Um, and I've been doing that now for the past 10 years. So every six months, I get a new set of new people. Um, and it's quite a different set of skills. So what we've heard from Ismail, and Ismail's obviously a very experienced surgeon, um, but he's getting that extra input um, to bring take him to the next level. But we're talking about how, did you, how do you get there? You don't start with a DALC, um, but a lot of people start with a um, cataract surgery. So I'm going to share... Um, slides here which I hope you can see and yeah so this was a, a study so I, as well as being a clinical ophthalmologist I also run the the United Kingdom we have a national ophthalmology database cataract audit so we collect all the information from about 80 percent of the hospitals in in England um, on what happened to the cataract surgery we look at complications and visual outcomes and we do an audit and we create reports for all the hospitals so they can see how your hospital is doing compared to other hospitals or how the surgeon is doing compared to other surgeons. So that's something we have in the UK. And this just this year, we've published a paper looking at risk factors for posterior capsule rupture. So from about a million operations, we were able to see what factors make it more likely that you'll have a, a posterior capsule rupture or vitreous loss with zonal rupture as well. And so, that, so in bronze medal position, if you're a young male patient, you've probably been fighting and you've got a cataract and you have your cataract removed, there's a high, there's a three odds ratio that you're going to have um, vitreous loss of posterior capsule rupture. Similarly, brunescent white cataracts. In silver medal position, sidereal exfoliation or phacodinesis. So if your lens is already wobbly before you've started this, oh, and by the way, this is only phaco emulsification. We only, we don't uh, evaluate the ECC or SICS. Uh, operations um, because the majority of the operations are all FACO in the UK. So, but the most dangerous thing for uh, patients is having an early stage trainee surgeon. And that gives you an odds ratio of 3.75. So nearly four times the odds of having a posterior capsule rupture if you have an early stage trainee operating on you. So that doesn't sound good. One day, uh, you know, that's going to be all of us on the table. And you don't want to be there terrified that you're going to have some early stage trainee uh, digging a hole in your posterior capsule. So what can we do about that? Well, in, in our hospital, we have a lot of signs around saying that safety is no accident. Uh, in fact, in every area of the hospital, they have these signs saying, and the, the point about the sign is saying that safety doesn't happen by accident. You have to intentionally create safety. So this is a picture of my operating theatre. So if you look at the orange mat on the floor, it's covering over the wire. So we're not waiting till someone trips over the wire. We're going to cover it with tape or put a mat on it. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of initiatives to say, where's the dangers? How can we reduce those dangers, whether they're tripping over wires or whatever? But if for our cataract surgery, all of us should be active in protecting our patients from the learning curve of our junior trainees. And I want to suggest you three things or three times that you can make a difference you, before the surgery starts, during the surgery and after the surgery. 
some things that you can do. Now, many of you will be aware, I mean, we, in fact, we just heard from in the video there from Maria about uh, simulation training. And there were some randomized control trials run by Will Dean in five African countries. Some of you on this call may have been part of that training, um, both for cataract surgery, uh, but also for glaucoma surgery. And both randomized control trials showed that running a short intensive simulation program helps reduce the complications and improve the surgical um, skills of trainees. Um, and those trials were really very important. And I think um, if you're not doing simulation with your very junior trainees, you should do. Before you touch a human eye, you need to be touching um, some sort of animal eye or plastic eye, if you can get hold of those. So I would, I would encourage everybody. I, I think in the modern world, there's no excuse not to do simulation. It's not expensive. It's not difficult. Uh, and really, we should all do that. So this is an ophthalmology talk. What's this doing? So it's about learning from our mistakes. Now, you have to learn from your mistakes. So I, I had a patient not that long ago. Uh, well, it was quite a, it was a while ago, but it was, uh, and it was a young lady in her twenties, late twenty five, and she had a very big tummy. And I was going to prescribe some antibiotics. So I needed to know. You know, I thought she was pregnant. I thought, what trimester is it safe to give this antibiotic? So I asked her when the baby was due, and then she looked at me, and then I realised there was no baby. I, I think probably it was fat. It wasn't fetus, flatus or fluid. Uh, so I made that mistake. I've never made that mistake again. Uh, so I'm never going to guess a woman's pregnant again. I'll just say, is there any chance she could be pregnant? So you've got to learn from your mistakes. One mistake that we don't want our juniors to make, they, they don't have to make that mistake. If you tell them, never guess that a woman is pregnant, that will help them. But also help them never to say, whoops, if they cut something they shouldn't, your patient is awake, uh, so you need to have a discussion with your um, trainee. If something bad happens, they need to not say whoops. They just need to stay calm, don't move. And then you need to agree some sort of signal. So if the trainee thinks that they need to stop and you're going to take over as the supervisor, then I would suggest that you agree a word such as um, beautiful or um, perfect or some sort of word that you're unlikely to use otherwise. Um, that the trainee can say as a signal that they want you to take over or you also have that same word. If you want the trainee to stop, because if you suddenly shout stop, I'm taking over, the patient is awake and they can hear you. So we want to have some agreements with the um, trainee about what codes you will use. Similarly, when you before you start operating with the trainee, before the patients come into the room, you need to agree what you're aiming to achieve today. So every operating list with my junior trainee, I say to them, right, today we're going to work on lens implantation or the irrigation aspiration removal of soft lens material. And we discuss how we're going to do it so that we are aiming for something specific. We're not just sitting down and starting operating and seeing what happens. We've got very specific learning goals for each operating list. So the microscope, this is something else you should do with every trainee before they're starting operating. So I, I like to mess up the um, optics um, if you dial one of them to plus two and the other one to minus two, uh, see if the trainee notices. I also like to um, loosen these knobs here. If the trainee doesn't know what all the different bits on the microscope do, they shouldn't be operating. So in my view, they need to know and understand their equipment before they use their equipment. Um, also, they need to check that the lens cover is clean from the previous operation. So if we go back to this picture of my operating theater um, here, this is... Uh, Actually, this is a, a senior surgeon here who's supervising this junior surgeon. Um, and, you know, you could say, well, if you, if you don't have the luxury of um, that direct supervision, but first year trainees, you must make the luxury. You have to sit and watch them like a hawk or they'll be doing things that you don't want and the patient doesn't want. So I would encourage everyone to be watched really for um, quite a significant period of months as they get more and more comfortable. So... My colleague is watching everything he's doing, but she's not just watching. She's also instructing and she in her hand, she has some drops uh, and she's pointing at what she wants him to do. So this is the senior surgeon. And on the camera here, this is her pointing at saying, you know, he's removing the soft lens material with this irrigation aspiration probe. And she's telling him, go for that bit next. OK, so. Yeah, so safety is no accident. You need to plan in advance. Uh, in fact, this is true not just for surgery, but for the whole of your eye care services. We, we published a paper a few years ago saying for the UK, it's not a surprise. You know, and it's the same in your country. The population is getting older and it's getting bigger. So it's, in 10 years time, you're going to have double the number of cataract patients you have now. You need to plan for the future. If you don't plan, 
then you're going to be struggling uh, when you get there. So I'm going to stop sharing there because the, so during the surgery, you're going to be watching, you're going to be giving instructions after the surgery. You've got this, uh, if you can make a video. Yeah, that's why I put the picture up there of, of our, our video. We, so we're able to, and you've seen all the devices that Ismail showed. It's not difficult these days to get video material of the surgery and Every day at the end of the case that my junior trainee is doing, or if he does a few cases, I say, right, what bit of that should we watch? And we, we go back to the video. It means I'm 20 minutes later home than I could be, but I feel like that's part of my role to train that person. So we watch the video again. He says what he thought went well, what went badly, and we unpack that. And we do that um, every week. So um, I would encourage you before, during, after, there's things you can do to make things safer for your trainee. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much, John. There was so much insight and wisdom and experience there. And um, thank you for your humility and sharing your, your mistakes as well as your successes. Um, so next up is Dr. Chikimatenge from Rwanda. Um, and I ask that you please, um, but you know, our, our participants put any questions in the Q&A or in the chat and we will answer everybody's questions about both speakers at the end of Chiku's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elmin. Um, um, I, I fell off, but it was briefly. Um, my name is Shiko Matenge, and I am a consultant ophthalmologist at the Rwanda International Institute of Ophthalmology, Rio, where we run a residency program, but we also do research and community services, as in this picture where my final year residents are out in a remote hospital with a supervisor uh, performing mass camp surgery. I also had that training the trainers subcommittee of Coexa. So listening to John, who is a better cataract surgeon than I am and a better trainer, uh, was really interesting and I learned a lot from listening to you. I'm also the serving president of the World of Thermology, uh, the African Ophthalmology Council. So my talk today is uh, about my own journey from being a, a resident a surgeon and to be now one who is training residents. Uh, let's see, my slides are not progressing. So the journey of a surgeon is, I say it's complex because it's, it's, it's really a testament to dedication, to skill and to compassion. And it involves not just mastering the surgical techniques, but also I believe you have to understand the human needs of the patients. And uh, surgeons are basically all the time navigating a path that demands technical precision, uh, a lot of empathy and compassion, and really a commitment to lifelong learning. So my path, I would like to divide it into these three sections. Uh, the, the first step was myself learning uh, how to do surgery and mastering the technical aspects. Uh, and then my journey as a, a consultant, reflecting and continuing to grow, and now as an educator, trying to pass on those, those skills to other surgeons. If we look at training and mastery, uh, I, I, I would like to tell all those who are learning surgery that no one is dying to teach you surgery. Even if you are their favorite trainee, no one is dying to teach you surgery. So your trajectory depends not only on your natural talent, and I can tell you most of my residents are blessed with an abundance of optimism about their natural talent, but it also depends on your desire and determination. So desire to learn is mandatory. What does that mean? You have to keep asking to be allowed to operate. You have to keep pleading, you have to keep begging sometimes. When I was a first year resident, I used to look at my seniors and wonder why some of them were so good at surgery while others were struggling. And within the first few months, I realized it all depended on their ability to plead and ask for steps of surgery and to beg consultants to allow them to operate. So desire to learn is mandatory. Secondly, I would say that nobody can inject skills into you. And you just had Dr. Uh, John talking about using wet labs, using simulations, volunteering to go to ICAMS and other such uh, difficult situations. 
that is the only way that you learn the skills. Microsurgery is difficult and no one is born with that skill. It's up to you as a trainee to look for these opportunities. And we are lucky these days that so many simulations, simulators, all types of wet lab material exist do not undervalue that. And I still use the wet lab even as a consultant. The third thing I'd say about training and mastery is that mentors are a vital part of that journey. And uh, in, in the photo on the bottom left is uh, Daksha Patel, who some of you know, those of you who passed through ICH. And Daksha was my senior in residency training. And I owe my journey and entry to surgery to Daksha. Daksha took me under her wing as a first year, very, very unconfident resident and took me through the very, very basic steps of surgery, how to use a microscope, how to hold the conjunctiva. We, we moved on to what to do if the simco suddenly doesn't work in the middle of an operation, how to get the cortex out. Uh, I remember Daksha teaching me something called the toothpaste method, which was about squeezing the cortex out so that it comes closer to where you can get it even with a bad, a, a bad simco. Those mentors who take you under your wing are such important people in your surgical career that you never forget them. And I'm eternally grateful to Daksha for really taking her time to, to take me through those difficult days. Mentorship is needed even after you stop being a resident. And the photo on the right is uh, Dr. David Moran from Australia, who taught me surgical techniques at a time when I thought they were way beyond me. I would never learn to, to do those things. But again, he took me under his wing as a young ophthalmologist and showed me that it was possible. And just having mentors and role models helps you to raise your standard and aspire for even better. And I, I never forget my mentors. And I hope that in life, I can also play the role of a mentor to many other people. Remember that your mentors can also be nurses. As a general doctor, I learned a lot of surgical techniques from nurses. Nurses know, they've, they've seen all types of trainees. They know the arrogant ones who think a nurse can teach them nothing. But believe me, the nurses know how what we are doing as ophthalmologists under that microscope. And having them on your team really makes your surgical journey uh, lighter. So the second part of being a surgeon is about reflection and growth. And uh, reflection is an important part of a surgeon's, uh, I would say, professional development. And it's part of lifelong learning. So reflection is important to me now as a consultant, but especially important for my trainees. And at, at Rio, we try to almost force the residents to have a nature of reflection. So reflection helps you to improve your decision making and also kind of get a better understanding of your insight into your values and your beliefs uh, as far as patient care is concerned. When you're reflecting, you reflect on what is past, but also on what is ongoing. And you do this through reviewing cases, through discussing outcomes with your peers, and through seeking feedback. At the minimum, be honest with yourself, even if you're not honest with others. As you reflect, be honest with yourself and where you are. And there are many kind of uh, structures that you can use when you are reflecting. So reflect about where you are as a surgeon, what you want to be and where you want to go. And part of that reflection for me here in this image, I am being taught vitreoretinal surgery. And part of my reflection was, do I really want to start a new journey training as a VR surgeon? And I decided I didn't because I just didn't feel I was committed enough to that field to want to start from the beginning. And I just learned the basics and stopped there, even though I had a fantastic mentor who was willing to teach me everything in VR. But as we master the art of surgery, let us not lose touch with the human side of medicine. So I got this photo from the internet, so I guess I can use it, but it, it disturbed me because sometimes in our quest to be excellent surgeons, to report on all those huge numbers of surgeries that, that we can, with, uh, that we did in a single day, we forget to maintain the dignity of the patients that we are dealing with. And we must maintain their dignity during surgery, during recovery, 
from the, how they are dressed to their space we are giving them, to calling them by their own names, not next case, to addressing their fears and anxieties. If a patient looks scared, talk to them, understand what it is. You know, I was recently a, a, a patient of surgery having my arm fixed. And uh, when you're on that table in a short dress and you're surrounded by five people in the room, it's really very unnerving. So let us not forget this human side of surgery. So now it's about passing on the skills. And uh, in these images, it's uh, me and my residents. And passing on the, on the skills, as I said, is not, it's, it's not easy. Uh, we started off at Rio with only a scan optics microscope, no viewing arm, no, no screen. And for my first four residents, it was really hard work to teach them surgery. But we persevered. And this is a graduate of that same four, of our first cohort, now enjoying being a consultant using a fancy microscope. Learn to do surgery with what you have. That's what I learned. Learn to do it with what you have. Teach, teach your residents to do with what is available, not what is possible. And in the future, when better things become available, it is much easier for them to adapt to better than to go back to less. And for me as a surgeon, I, I always want people to pass skills to me where I am. So I'd rather invite a skilled doctor like Dr. Sangwan to come to my hospital, teach me with what I have, with the nurses I have, and let me learn in an environment that I can continue working in rather than going to a fancy, uh, a fancy setup, which actually is a, uh, pretty artificial for me. So, but I do feel a commitment to now uh, pass on skills at this stage of my career. And I am what I am because others also decided to pass on skills. Let us not be selfish with our skills. So in conclusion, a surgeon's journey is about learning precision surgery, but with empathy. It's about seeking to learn from when you're a resident to even after you stop being a resident. It's about reflecting and using that reflection as a way to grow. And finally, it is about passing on the skills to the next person after you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chiku. That was so much wisdom distilled into such a short presentation. And, and there's some nice comments and feedback in the chat as well. So um, this is a great time to open up for questions, both for, for Dr. John Bucket and for Dr. Chiku Mathenge. Um, so does anybody, are there any questions in the Q&A, Hugh? I wonder if you can let me know. Um, I'm going to work backwards because that's easier for me. We have a uh, uh, just a point raised here by uh, Sunil Mareka. Um, Sunil, it would be lovely to know where you're joining us from. Um, Sunil says, excellent point raised by Dr. Chiku as we focus on the second pillar of education, namely skills. The same mentorship can be used for training mentee in the third domain, additional, the attitudinal domain of medical education technology, ethics, respect and dignity. So Chiku, do you want to reflect on that? Um, I think he's, he said it well. Uh, Absolutely, uh, it's, it's something that sometimes we can forget because we get caught up in teaching the skills, but how you handle the patient, that's what the patient remembers. They don't care that you put in the best intraocular lens. They, they remember the experience of having come to your OR. That's true, that's true. And I think Sunil, again, another comment, thank you for it. Um, talking about, um, you know, mentoring is maybe a lifelong process um, for everybody involved in, in IK and, and uh, you know yeah it's any comments on that from yourself or from John as well I mean do, do you do you still seek mentorship both you you know Chico and John as very experienced surgeons and senior surgeons yeah I, I, I regularly watch YouTube videos uh, to see what's out there there's there's so much good material uh, you know available for developing your cataract skills there's not many courses to, to like uh, if you don't to learn to chop so I, in fact i i did something in my hospital like we i've got about 25 colleagues i asked the nurses who's the best cataract surgeon so and <laughs> they said oh <laughs> they said you are of course but <laughs> if I, no, they didn't say that but if they, they <laughs> just trying to be polite no they said um they, so they told me one of my colleagues and they said so i, I got my colleague to come and or 
I, I went to watch him operate and then I got him to come and, and try to copy his technique. And actually, I, I really learned a lot by doing that. He only came just for, you know, half an hour. He did he did one case, and then I copied him for one case and he watched me. And then, but uh, from then, I you know, that was really useful. So ask your nurses. Fantastic. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, it's unfortunate the older you get, the less mentors you have and the less opportunities to be mentored you have. Uh, but you know, our field changes so much that you, what you are expert in today, the technology and what is achievable it becomes, you know, the, we, we never reach that target. Everything keeps changing. And uh, we, we, we need to keep up with that. And um, I love watching other surgeons. It, it's amazing, as John says, you, you always learn something, whether it's the way they irrigate the eye or whether I, I was watching Ismail's video and even there I learned something. I mean, tell him what now, but it's, 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 it's amazing. We, we, we all need mentors all our lives. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and any other questions I, here? Because I, I, I've got one here that was actually for Ismail. Um, and it's sort of, and I guess this is an important point because um, there's, there's one thing, maybe it's the same, maybe it's the same, but when do you know that you're ready for for online or virtual mentorship you know if you're a general ophthalmologist what preparations did you have to make before you were ready to take on sort of take the next step with a mentor to kind of go on to the corneal side of things uh that is a point that i should have kind of in, 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 in emphasized so just a bit of background of myself um i'm a general ophthalm op there's no formal fellowship training in south africa so if you want to get formal fellowship training, then you have to go somewhere where you can get it. And obviously, there's a very, there's a huge shortage of ophthalmologists, and there's a massive number of patients. So, being in this situation, I was exposed to a multitude of different subspecialities. So, um, I used to work at the Vitro Retinal Unit at St. John's Eye Hospital. Um, um, I also have a lot of a keen interest in corneal surgery, refractive surgery, and also glaucoma surgery. So multitude of skills and I also I'm also a trainer at the clinical development courses launched by Alcon and Orbis so I take cataract um, surgery as well so I think that there's the point that needs to be raised is that when he, as a surgeon uh, you comfortable at different levels so if you're at the beginning of your training there has to be a hands-on approach and that's why they have medical schools uh, we're not going to be in, in ophthalmology training centers. Um, and as John has, um, has, has emphasized the point of having uh, personal training, it's, it, 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 is, it cannot be understated. But there's different aspects um, when it comes to training. So it's the level of your expertise, then also what you have available to you. Uh, well, Dr. Chiku has mentioned it as well. And your personal ambition to learn more. So I regard myself as a, as a trainer and as a trainee. I'm continuously learning, enhancing my skills to pass on more skills. And I do learn from mentors and I learn from students. And that's one point that we raise. So if we're going to look, if as a, pers as a person looking or uh, watching this webinar, interacting with this web webinar, I would break it down in a couple of points. One is what level am I at? Two is what equipment do I have? And three, who's my mentor? Who can be my uh, possible mentor? Um, and four is what resources do I have available? As in, uh, we have the internet available. We have uh, resources you can use to enhance our knowledge, but also resources when it comes to practicing. So uh, is there a wet lab close by? Which companies can assist us in particular situations to organize a wet lab for particular types of surgeries? And then to practice on models which are available. Um, and something that just pops into my mind, keeps popping in my mind, is if you want to learn how to do a CCC, there's been an app for many years, more than 10 years. It's on the, you can find it, how to practice a CCC. There's many, many, many different tools that can be used. So I'd break it down into those, those different subgroups and then decide at which point, uh, one, which type of mentor one and which surgery I'm going to be approaching. Um, Cybersight is a, is a nice platform to do that. So if you're not sure, log on and ask the question. There's always going to be somebody answering it. Um, I think nowadays with the community that we have, I, I call it a community, there's no subdivision now. Uh, community of ophthalmologists, they, you're just a phone call away from some help. Thank you so much, Ismail. Yes, and I just wanted to finally also pick up on um, Chiku's point about 
the nurses and the importance of the whole eye team, the whole surgical team. Um, so I'm just really, really glad you, you've highlighted that. Um, and um, I think there's, there's so much to cover, um, but we may, may need to have some more webinars on it. Um, and, and John, something else I just wanted to pick up on in conclusion and also to connect with what Ismail has said here is the importance of simulation and, and models. So there was an issue of the Community Eye Health Journal on surgical uh, skills training that focused very heavily on very cheap, affordable simulation um, sort of tools, you know, working on apples, like things that you can do locally for a relatively low cost. And we're hoping if, if we get the funding, we will be um, having a series of articles in every issue of the Community Eye Health Journal going forward about that. So um, Kriti is um, sending us a link for the South Asia edition. Thank you so much, Kriti. I'm glad you're here. Um, and if you go to our journal website, cjournal.org, um, and you just go through the previous issues, please do have a look at our surgical simulation um, series, um, sorry, uh, issue, which is basically what this would inspired this webinar um, and thank you we've just gone over time thank you so much to our panelists we've really appreciated your participation there's been so much learning in exchange and um, it's been wonderful to see our presenters sort of nod and, and and find these connection points and i hope everybody's had a lot that you've gained from it i'd love to know how you're going to change your practice what are you going to change as a result of what you've learned today in the webinar and um, we've got a link in the chat uh, we'll put the link on youtube as well in the chat there and um, so yeah send us your feedback thank you again everybody and um greetings take care and look after your patients goodbye thank you thanks bye